Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hello and welcome to FYI, ARC's four-year innovation podcast. We're super happy today to welcome Constantine, the CEO and founder of Blockdaemon, and Chris Sharp, Blockdaemon's CTO, uh, to talk today about uh, Blockdaemon and and crypto infrastructure. Uh, Super happy to have you guys on the show. Thank you. Maybe we could just start right off with with kind of intros and and would love to hear kind of your view on the founding story of, of Blockdaemon, Constantine. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I'm Constantine. I'm the CEO and founder. Uh, of Block Daemon. Um, I, uh, I'm going to tell the founding story and then Chris can take, jump in when, when his journey started. Um, the company started late 2017, early 2018. I've been an entrepreneur for, for a while. Uh, I got really passionate about crypto. Sort of towards 2015, so sort of I started structural engagements and working with projects and, and joining some of the open source collaborative nature of things. Um, and uh, decided to, you know, start a company in the space. I was fairly analytical at the time, thinking what has legs, what really solves the problem that I have experienced myself in the space. And one of them was trying to run an Ethereum node with a few friends for an ERC-20 token launch and, and, and really struggling keeping the node in sync. And so the sort of idea of like, hey, there should be a company that makes this really professional. So professional users can ultimately connect and use node infrastructure. And so, and that's where, where what the genesis block of block demon was, so to speak, um, right from the start, the idea was to be um, very institutionally focused. So go in with um, a cap table that reflects a more uh, institutional setup from the beginning. And so in our seed round, there weren't any crypto native funds, for example, we raised money from folks like Comcast and, and Bold Start, our uh, lead investor at the time, and others. Uh, but you know, we kind of try to really build that DNA very early into like we need to be a company that can sell B two B SaaS software. And I mention it because it's an important principle um, that stays true to us until today. That's very difficult to reverse, reverse engineer when you're not getting it right. You know, and so it starts with the sort of company setup. Who are the people involved? How are you capitalized? even down to how the share structure looks in, in terms of what's the oversight I experienced. So we always, we never had a dual share class. I was always uh, part of the board, but reporting into the board. And um, and there's always been a good degree of oversight at Block Demon. But that's how we started. And we, we um, uh, started in LA uh, after I secured a little more money after we launched the first product suite, which was really Bitcoin and Ethereum full nodes uh, launched across three different cloud providers. Uh, actually two different cloud providers initially, uh, but three different data centers in each. So it was very simple, like three click deployment of an ETH full node, you know, on Amazon, for example. And so we had that early 2018. I think we were the first who had kind of that type of product, um, uh, pretty hard to market at the time because not a lot of people saw the benefit of like, Hey, why do I want to pay someone to, to do something? I can just download some open source software and run on the server myself. Um, even if it's janky, the, requirements in the network and expectation around crypto was low enough that people weren't like, hey, I need to make sure there's instant settlement, that my transaction goes through. People were kind of used to complicated gas fees and transactions being declined and long delays. And and so I'd say, it, it and also at the same time, the market collapsed uh, on us. And so it was a difficult birthing process. Um, but we, you know, we, we believed in a future in which crypto 
ultimately revolutionizes our financial system because we saw a lot of problems in the financial system. So our long-term strategy of providing rails for institutions to connect to crypto networks has never changed. We've been true to that um, uh, since the beginning. And, um, and over time, adoption of our product suite has increased and then ultimately accelerated in 2020 post-COVID um, uh, much more um, significantly. Um, at that point, our product suite also contains staking, um, which is ultimately, um, uh, you know, also a node. It's just that it's a node that uh, uh, earns fees differently. And so that was exciting for us because it connected us to volume-driven revenue. And then in 2021, we laid the strategy of ultimately how the company looks today, which is we wanted to really build a platform for institutions to have a singular node stack that connects them to the crypto universe, right? And what that means is uh, node infrastructure for read and write, right? So read and write means pulling data from a ledger and as well as submitting transactions to a ledger. So a node is needed if, you know, you want to send a Bitcoin from your wallet to Chris's wallet here, then in the ledger, it'll say, hey, Frank has eight Bitcoins. Now he's taking one Bitcoin and sending it to Chris, who now has one Bitcoin. You know, that's ultimately how that looks like. And then every time another transaction comes in, that's what a ledger does. And that's what a node does ultimately. And so, um, uh, and that software is specific to each protocol uh, and how that software interacts with the server on the cloud or locally is also different per protocol. And we kind of manage that read and write function. Um, that's the principal product we offered um, that got uh, a lot more API'd. Uh, and so it's a lot simpler and uh, you can funnel a lot more transactions through sort of, you know, a much larger instance base. Staking uh, required also an API. And so we've evolved that since 2021. And then the third big part for us was the wallet architecture. And so we now provide, uh, you know, what we think is the best institutional MPC wallet uh, where we're never custodial, we're always um, uh, non-custodial. So we allow institutions to do these things themselves, right? So we sell them infrastructure so they can transact and offer their customers the ability to move tokens around, to earn rewards on tokens, to secure these tokens via wallets. And so the wallet layer has multiple stacks. There's the first institutional one where an institution can have two or three wallets, manage certain tokens and policies that are MPC'd and encrypted um, that we can't touch. Uh, really easily um, via using our API infrastructure. And so less friction around integrations. One of the big learnings we've had with institutions in the first two years of the company is that the vendor ecosystem is very, very difficult to understand and introduces a lot of risk. And so this sort of singular integration stack that we can run liabilities and warranties against and offer SLAs and have clear responsibility and ownership, uh, we think is a very competitive angle. And, um, and thus, you know, we, we knew at the time that we needed a really, really strong leader around the wallet stack uh, to have these sort of initial institutional wallets, but then also uh, the, the capability for institutions to offer their customers wallets that are integrated back into that institutional wallet, right? And so um, it sort of makes us a sort of B2B to C wallet play. Uh, something people call VAS uh, in the market, wallet as a service. But but that was sort of the idea running on this like complex infrastructure that we power. Um, there are uh, interoperability plays, on-chain swaps, and, and things like that that we want to enable and monetize. So for Blockdemon, these multiple revenue flywheels around transaction enablement and APIs, potentially transaction fees, staking rewards, potentially liquid staking, uh, uh, fees and then license fees and volume driven seed fees around wallets make this very interesting, right? It gives us a mix of tokens and USD and uh, ultimately drives average contract value up over time. And so now that was a long winded point, but, but the reason why I'm bringing us here is uh, twofold. And so uh, later investors in the company, when we raised a lot of money in 2021, where included folks like Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, and Citibank, for example, I think we're the only crypto company with three of the top 10 global banks on the cap table as major holders. Um, uh, same is true on the customer set. At this point, these they're all customers, so it's PayPal and Robinhood and other companies in the space using node infrastructure uh, range from all the top exchanges to every top custodian uh, to, I mean, you, you name it. I think we have between 50 to 70% market share across cohorts there. We run over 150,000 nodes. We think we're probably the largest node operator in the world just because we have that unique mix of read and write to nodes and staking nodes. 
And on the wallet architecture, uh, we have one of the best encryption teams in the world. Uh, at this point, uh, we have customers on our existing wallet stack, um, like Volkswagen and Rolex and NASDAQ and, uh, and Rakuten and, and others. And, and now what we call internally Mothership, our institutional wallet, is also live in the market and, and has a lot of integration points. And then there's the consumer version extension of that that we're hoping to launch in the next quarter or so. And so at that point in time in late 21, I knew I needed a wallet stack. Uh, we acquired a company called CPR and we also um, made, um, uh, really thought about who's a great leader for this, who represents the sort of strong focus on quality that these institutional players we work with can respect. And so um, we um, looked around in the world and, and one of the financial applications we really admire is Apple Pay. And, uh, and so we felt like uh, I come from the mobile phone space. And so I always think of like, you know, mobile innovation is really a driver also connected to crypto networks in a way and payment networks. And so what's the most stable, most reliable, most ubiquitous used wallet and payment architecture you can think of? It's probably on the iPhone, you know. And so Chris um, uh, was the sort of you know, lead engineer in that uh, project and, and, and uh, we courted him for a long, long time. And uh, he, he finally decided to make the jump at a difficult time also in the market, you know. And so we really valued his professionalism, his background and his uh, vision and for, for one quality as well as, uh, you know, a leader who developed his life in Apple at a company that's so focused on performance and slickness was something that's really, really important for us. And so he joined us, I want to say, in May, April, May 2022, um, and, and the minute that happened, uh, 3AC and Terra collapsed. Uh, I don't know what button he pressed. And so he kind of came to us in a really interesting time, and it was really inspiring to kind of see him be undaunted about the vision that we defined together and him really taking ownership of our product stack. Um, and, but yeah, maybe, Chris, you want to talk a little bit about uh, yourself as an introduction and, and kind of some of the things you do. And then, so, sorry, Frank, I know we're kind of going on. Uh, no yeah. worries. No, I love hearing hearing the stories. And it's almost like, you know, Block daemon has been alive for, I, I think, at least two, maybe a little bit more full crypto market cycles. And it's almost like a, a rite of passage. Like you started Block Damon shortly before the 2018 crash. Yeah. I started getting into crypto. I was, you know, doing my own at-home minings, yeah. very, very small scale uh, in 2017. So right before that crash. And and Chris, you came in uh, right at perfect timing for this round. <laughs> yeah, perfect in air quotes. Um, yeah. Very kind <laughs> words. So thank you, Constantine. Yeah, just as an introduction, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm the CTO, um, but I'm also, uh, you know, not only responsible for engineering, but also product. And, th and that was something that um, Constantine kind of trusted, trusted me with and has been a whole heck of a lot of fun. Uh, before joining uh, Block Demon, I was, I was at Apple uh, for 23 years. Um, yeah, you know, between um, late 2013 and 2022, I was you know the sort of engineering uh, leader responsible for all server side stuff related to Apple Pay. And so, um, you know, one one of the things that we sort of prided ourselves on was sort of trying to think in terms of platforms, right? And so, you know, the same platform that's used to provision a, a credit card or a debit card is actually used for transit in, in Shanghai or Beijing or or Tokyo. Uh, and so the same sets of APIs, the same sort of, you know, abstractions, the, the same sort of mentality from a platform perspective uh, was something that, that gave us a lot of bang for our buck. And, you know, when I, when I, when, when I joined Constantine's team, so sort of, sort of one of the things that I had been thinking about was like, hey, how can I take some of the, some of the core learnings? You know, a lot of times you get, um, you get th these questions of like, hey, how did you go from this big company to this, to this small company and, and how has the transition been? Uh, and frankly, it's been it's been quite smooth because uh, you know we're just probably running at uh, I'd say seven x or eight x the speed block team in does uh, you know so that's one difference but trying to you know r wrestle uh, over what features are in or what features are out you know that's that's pretty identical from from that perspective um, you know the focus on platform building you know Constantine mentioned the institutional wallet and the institutional wallet is. You know, for me, just a, a, a super fun play, playground, right? Because I get to take a lot of the experience I had in building the Apple Wallet and you know attempt to provide that same love and care and feeding uh, to this to this product. Now, it's you know obviously it's institutional focused, and so there's going to be you know changes in, in the kinds of activities, but the focus on 
really doing things um, uh, from a platform perspective. So, you know, example, we just added, you know, in in wallet staking. So someone can, you know, click a button and stake their ETH without having to do anything complicated whatsoever. Uh, obviously, all the sorting and the, and, and the reporting and, and these sorts of things are, you know, from an institutional product perspective, very, very well integrated. But again, you know, could have taken many different approaches for doing that. Uh, we, we provide one user experience, but because we're sort of an API first company, all of the APIs that we use to build a wallet are ones that an institution could use directly uh, and it's all 100% on-prem. Um, so that's been a lot of fun. And you know, before the, the Apple Pay stuff, I, I did some other fun things, uh, but, but you know, it was always very, you know, from 2016 really onward, trying to figure out how to weave the sort of crypto narrative into the things that I was doing. And then uh, when Constantine reached out, I kind of like this light went off in my head, like, wait, I could actually be paid to be doing something that I really love. And it could be like a career like, oh, wow. Like, OK, that's that's kind of cool. So that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, that, I think that's that's why I came to work at Arc because I was doing the same thing. I was messing around with crypto in my part time. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, this company will pay me to research crypto full time. That sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe we could go a level deeper on the wallet because I think I think it's kind of interesting. Maybe you know the most common crypto wallet, self custody wallet people have used is MetaMask. What, what's the difference between an institutional wallet that that makes it institutional grade compared to say a MetaMask? Look, MetaMask is is incredible. It's it really is. It's pioneering. It's feature feature risk is is really really quite an amazing uh, a, a product. Um, when we think about our institutional wallet, though, uh, we're thinking about um, you know, how do you make sure that the private keys are are as secure as possible? And and the big the big difference for us is that uh, in some ways you could say we don't have a private key because we're using multi party computation or MPC. And and what that does is it, it sort of takes that private key and splits it up into these sort of anonymous shards on some number of, of computers that are running as part of the the, the institutional wallet cluster. And in simplistic terms, uh, instead of uh, sort of recombining that private key in order to perform a signing operation, what's happening is there's a series of mathematical calculations between the nodes that's occurring. And so the private key actually never exists in any one place at any time, ever. And so now if you have a, a hacker you know, that's able to get into your infrastructure and gain access to one of your institutional wallet you know, hosts or nodes, um, it's really not going to compromise the security story at all. You layer on top of that, um, you know, using a trusted execution environment like AWS Nitro, as an example. And all of a sudden now, even a bad actor within that environment can't see, touch or change or, or, or negatively impact any of the security story on one or any of the nodes whatsoever. And so, um, you know, that's the basis. And then on top of that, we have our, our policy engine and the policy engine if you think about the way things have been done, and I, you know, I built my whole career off of building applications using hardware signing modules or HSMs. Um, and you know, the, the wonderful thing about HSMs is that the private key is secured by hardware. That's great. But who can tell the private key to perform a signing or encryption operation? Well, anyone can, like anyone who has access to that host. And so the, the, the secret, the devil in the details is really that if you don't have a robust policy engine that is as secure as the as the private key being protected by hardware, then all bets are off, right? And the thing that we think is so amazing about, uh, you know, the institutional wallet is that that policy engine is as secure as, as any of the MPC operations, right? And so I can say, well, you know, if, uh, if I'm going to send, you know, half a Bitcoin to, you know, whoever, then I need at least three people in the treasury department. So we have the notion of groups, um, very sophisticated, right? Um, and, you know, all of this is is totally on-prem, right? So you're, com you're completely in control of how these things work. Um, you know, after we sell a customer the institutional wallet, it's technically impossible for block team and to negatively impact the security story of that software. And so that really makes um, that makes a, a lot of folks feel very, very comfortable, especially in the light of things that have happened with you know FTX and, and others. Yeah, super interesting. The, the security component is so, so important, right? And I assume one of the things that institutions care about more than anything else. I'm, I'm curious, kind of, Constantine, how you've seen 
the the level of sophistication in institutions evolve over the last five years or so? Uh, what does an institution care about and look for in crypto today versus um, maybe in the early days, or may, maybe they weren't even uh, may, and different types of institutions may have not even been talking to you in the early days. That's correct. I mean, I think early on um, the the uh, customer base that we were able to talk to was either uh, crypto native, smaller exchanges with little budget who didn't have DevOps teams, and then really a lot of focus on permission networks. And we're coming a little full circle here, right? Like, and so back in the day. Uh, you know, there was like Hyperledger and, and, and a lot of permissioned versions of things. And so we had customers like Shell Oil and, you know, like back then it was like supply chain was a big thing. And and so I feel like the 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 thing that has changed is one, um, I think no matter even even JP Morgan, uh, no matter what uh, uh, Mr. Diamond says, uh, believes in Bitcoin, you know, and so I think the general perspective is that there's a crypto asset class that is here to stay and that that becomes a financial asset that needs to be served by any financial institution in the world to their respective customer base. And I think that belief is now a lot more solidified than it was five years ago, right? There was a lot more questions around Bitcoin, right? Like, I mean, there were so many moments where we thought, does this thing die, right? And we see the culmination of this with the proximity of an ETF uh, approval for Bitcoin or ETH. Right. And the minute that happens, you know, that kind of means it's here, you know, and that means if you're a financial institution, you need infrastructure to service customers and hold assets um, in that domain. And I think that awareness is a major shift. Um, And so it's actually uh, not so much the sort of, you know, when people talk about like, I find it interesting, like the skill application, like what's the use case and stuff like Bitcoin is the use case. You know what I mean? Like the asset class itself now is the use case. You know, like it's it's a currency uh, ultimately that's owned um, uh, by a software um, that seems to have made it. You know, I mean, it's like if you go back to the, uh, the inception or just even 10 years to 2013, that's an insane result. You know, if we ever would have thought that this would be the case. And so, you know, and I think we're very close here. And so I think that's been the major change that um, uh, companies that, you know, kind of were experimenting with like little projects here and there now have to contend and think about how do we offer our clients Bitcoin as an asset class? And 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 do we allow people to store Bitcoin in respective custodial services and wallets and things? And so that's obviously why we're a, a big thing we're seeing and that we're really excited about. Um, I think there's also a lot of progress been made around tokenization and and other assets uh in 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 form of digital digital structures which is really the pixelation of assets ultimately it's just better you know like it's just faster and more secure and easier to trade to tokenize certain things you know if you ever bought a bond or something you know the piece of paper um you know like there's obviously a great digital version of this then that makes sense you know like it's similar like what we did with music it's just easier to you know download something and send it to a friend than do that with a cd and so tokenization i think is another thing that um has evolved a lot and and some of it is we can see in our own infrastructure and work chris has done in tokenizing uh, building tokenization facilities into our institutional wallet architecture so people can actually tokenize assets themselves and, and do things uh, with it. And I think we're going to also, um, we're a lot closer here to to reality than we were uh, five years ago when people kind of thought about it, but the path to it seemed really complicated. And now the path to it seems to be pretty clear, dependent on some form of clarity around regulation, but technically is really, really seamless, you know? And so um, I see a lot of change there as well. Yeah, and so it's been interesting in this complex market in crypto, specifically in the US. Um, But uh, obviously, you know, token prices and when people make money, that kind of drives a lot of the narrative. And and it feels like the settle, like the FTX debacle, that was really a really difficult moment for our industry, specifically in the US. Is sort of not behind us, but you know, Binance just got settled. Um, uh, Bitcoin prices are going up again. Um, it looks like Bitcoin was probably the best investment asset class you could have invested in. That's a larger thing, 
uh, in the last 12 months. And that'll become apparent to financial institutions and, and people who are like, hey, why am I not in this? You know, and and I think the more often we get to a point where people say this thing is going to die and then it doesn't and it comes back in these cycles, by definition, these cycles get larger. And so I think there's this inherent exponential phase here. But yeah, for us, it's been really exciting working with with these large banks and and thinking about um, digital asset infrastructure from a custodial perspective, from a transaction-centric perspective, and then over time, hopefully around a reward or interest perspective, which is a little harder um, in the US specifically. But like, for example, in certain regions, like in Japan, we actually launched a banking-driven staking service with SBI, for example. Like in other territories, regulation is maturing faster and you can see the onset of these services to consumers which obviously for a platform like us is super important because the big thing here is we're still very early in terms of institutional inflow of assets right like and so block demons commercial model is just starting ultimately you know like we think the staking market can be 10 20 100 times x than what it is today and it's the same for institutional volume for bitcoin and and, and ethereum for example and so that's why we like these flywheels, because we think for us, there's this 100x scenario here uh, when floodgates open. And uh, what we need to make sure is that we're ubiquitous as entry gateways uh, for institutions into this space. Yeah. When I think about the market dynamics for Bitcoin, it's like very much, especially now, the genie's out of the bottle and every and it's not going back in. And every marginal buyer of Bitcoin is a supporter of Bitcoin right. and, and then eventually crypto broadly um, in most cases. I, I'm... It would be very interesting this election cycle in the U.S. to see what happens. I'm sure crypto and AI will probably be two two major topics. Um, but the the U.S. really needs to catch up to the rest of the world, like, especially on like the tokenization front or just, just generally cr- clear laws. Uh, like, what are you guys seeing uh, uh, around the world in terms of what areas are, are are pursuing kind of thoughtful regulation that is opening up doors for things like tokenization? Where, like, at least if from my view in the U.S., there's a lot of companies doing good things and, and moving the ball forward, but you still have to battle with the SEC and what what they'll allow on-chain kind of as duplicative record keeping, but the, you know, the real records are off-chain, uh, for example. Yeah, and that's a really valid point. And, and one thing I can only point out, like for us, like one of the reasons why we're still around after these really difficult two years is that uh, besides deciding to build a wallet stack and, and getting you know someone like Chris to help us do that, uh, we also decided to uh, move Block Demon more aggressively into Asia and Europe. And so we opened offices in those respective regions, and both of those have grown a lot. And so uh, we have an office in Singapore and a team out there, and, and the same um, out of Europe. We actually run a good chunk of our, out of our engineering over there, but we also have uh, regional market leaders there for us. And, and it's been really interesting to see how different regions treat these things differently. Uh, and when people say Asia, you know, it's a lot of Asia is big, you know, like there's a lot of versions yeah. of Asia. But, um, you know, we've always been really close to the Japanese market. Um, we have, you know, quite a few Japanese investors on our cap table. Um, and so um, we've been um, making inroads there for a long time, talking to regulators. And 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 it's interesting how uh, they've taken so long to progress that for, you know, when when the U.S. was booming, we were kind of sort of look at ah, this is all slow and not, you know, but what really happened is that they progressively advanced regulation. And uh, in most Asian territories, I think they're much, much closer to um, uh, offer much larger on ramps and reward mechanisms securely. And they provide very good guidance around it. I give you a good example. Uh, if you want to offer staking and have nodes, for example, it's just, you know, one of the guidances we've learned is they like to have nodes in their respective territory. And so if you offer white label validators, that's like a good thing to know. So it's just like, oh, this single data center model is not going to work for you. You know, if you want to run nodes for these people in these regions, you need software to, you know, do that in an Amazon data center or on a bare metal rack over there. And so like they they have more detailed guidance around how infrastructure needs to look. And so that factors a lot more in their respective planning and discussions. And thus, we have much more market share in those markets specifically because, uh, you know, we're pretty singular as, as we run nodes and I think 70 different data centers around the world. Like it's something that's a little unique to us, you know, and so we're, we're very good at that. And so 
I think there's the uh, same in Europe to an extent. Um, I think um, uh, certain regions in Europe have a lot more clarity and, and there is an application process and you can get a license and, and do things. Um, so the expectation is that the bulk of the volume uh, in 2024, we think initially it's going to come from Asia and Europe, but we do think the U.S. obviously has a huge leverage anchor. And so um, the minute I think um, uh, the prices uh, get uh, uh, more aggressive, the more clarity we get, even via lawsuits, right? Like Coinbase obviously fights a battle here for all of us. Uh, the more lawsuits the SEC loses based on poor regulatory practices, ultimately, the more we set precedents and the more we ultimately build a regulatory framework, even if it comes via um, uh, failed enforcement mechanisms, right? And so we don't care what it is, you know, like you can govern us any which way you want. We just want to know what it is so we can put it in place. And so I think we're going to see a lot of inroads there. But um, uh, but yeah, I think it's been interesting to see how different territories look at staking with that example of like, we need this infrastructure to be in this region, right? And so that's been an experience in Japan and Korea, like very concretely. Uh, and it's, you know, I was just in the Middle East and it looks like that's going to be very similar over there as well. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's like kind of reminiscent of GDPR in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. This is a random anecdote, but I learned that there are um, Canadian ETFs. that. So this isn't even just an Asia story, but even Canada, like our neighbor to the north is 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 much more progressive than we are, that they have Canadian ETFs that can hold staked Ether, not just ETH, but staked ETH, which is just, it's great and kind of makes a lot of sense that, especially compared to an individual staking themselves, like you want an institution providing staking services for you in a regulated vehicle. Exactly. Yeah. Um, outside of regulators, like how, how have even um, the big cloud providers changed and adapted their views uh, uh, towards crypto over time? Like I, I remember, you know, GPU shortages, uh, you know, I, I was thinking to myself, oh, I'll just go rent GPUs in AWS, but they don't want you mining in the cloud. Do they, did they not let you run nodes and now they let you host nodes? Obviously, you're partnering with them today. Um, and why can't they just offer these services themselves? Like, why do they need a block daemon to help? Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, first and foremost, they definitely don't want you to mine in the cloud. Uh, and so <laughs> I, we've never done that also. Uh, nodes were always uh, something they were interested in. What's obviously interesting around node infrastructure that if you monetize, ultimately compute, distributed networks are great because they ultimately create a lot of, um, uh, there's a need for a lot more compute than is actually necessary for the uh, actual uh, net data. Right, because it's like, oh, we need ten thousand copies on this on independent different instances and servers, and so there's this sort of natural love cloud providers have for the concept because they're like, hey, this is a huge expansion area for us. Um, because the reality is that cloud and GPU power um, is is ultimately gets cheaper every year, right? And so it's an interesting concept of if I'm a cloud company, how do I think about growing my business, right? And so. And, and uh, distributed mechanisms uh, and, and software like that presents a theoretical opportunity for this because you need a lot of copies of things. Um, I think, and so the interest has always been there. I think it still is somewhat there. It really varies a little bit on token prices. You know, they they kick off big initiatives when token prices are high and then they sort of filter out a little, never really quite die down and then go up again. But mostly, you know, they view this uh, probably as an interesting market to sell into. So I feel like companies like AWS and Google um, like crypto because they could probably sell a lot of infrastructure to companies like us and Coinbase and others, right? Like, so it's just like, hey, you guys have quite large requirements. Fantastic. And so the revenue they make on selling cloud compute to crypto companies far outweighs any money they can make selling nodes to people. Um, uh, and the reason why is not that that's a terrible market per se. It's also really, really difficult for them because the reality is nodes are, you know, pieces of software um, is a big part of it that is ultimately controlled by an open source community that's non-linear in its evolution, you know? So it's very hard to build and we live that every day, right? Like, it's not like, oh yeah, we have a release cadence once a month at 12 PM this time um, uh, we do X or, um, and, and so it's, it's really difficult for engineers to, develop the discipline to be active in a protocol over a long period of time uh, to really guarantee performance. And so if you have a brand of an Amazon or Google or Microsoft and you put your name behind like, hey, I'm managing this node for you, 
you're kind of saying I'm an expert in Ethereum and there's a handful of engineers here who live and breathe this every day who do nothing but that. And I think that's a commitment that's hard because it's expensive and tricky to do if you do it like we do for like 50, 60, 70 protocols, you know? And so I feel like they always think about it in this way of like, we can automate this via one software script that we write once and then it just works. And then they learn that, hey, this thing needs to be rejuggled and reconfigured. And actually blockchains grow every day as well. So the complexity of the network increases over time. And so I think they found that companies like us ultimately are a lot better suited to do this well. Right. And so at this point, I think technically a uh, block demon, because we run so many nodes as well, like we have software we use internally to run all this infrastructure that might look interesting to those type of companies more than anything else, where it's just more like, hey, can we license something you guys are building to help us do this? Or can we market it to people so they can just deploy nodes directly into the cloud? In the end, we don't care. You know, the reality is um, uh, we don't monetize hardware. Right. And so we monetize the service uh, of running the software and ensuring that the node has high performance and works all the time that can, you know, in theory, you can, you know, we don't care in theory um, if you deploy the node in your instance or in ours, you know, the difference is I'd prefer it to be in yours, frankly. So I don't have to put it over head. <laughs> it's then a question of how do you manage the software to do that? And it's a little bit of a different structure, but it's not something that we're unaware of and that we, you know, it's something we're thinking about all the time. Um, yeah. And so I think that's something I see a lot more. And I think that'll heat up again once crypto prices heat up um, and, and, and that becomes more, more, you know, budgets increase again. It'll be interesting, but we have strong partnerships with all of them. I'd say at this point, like, and people were initially were always saying, oh, Amazon is going to do this. They told me that five years ago when I couldn't raise money. And then they released some things and they can, you know, I'm not saying these guys, these are brilliant companies and they're smart and they have a lot of great people. Um, It's just a question of um, uh, really focus. And, you know, at this point you need hundreds of engineers to do this well. Like this is not done by like here, we have four guys and we want to build a little something. Uh, You need to offer five nines uptime and SLAs and around the world customer support and, deep on technical understanding and knowledge about each of these protocols and stuff. And so um, they can do, certainly do it, but it, at this point would require really, really hefty investment um, to get to that level um, is sort of my view. I don't know, Chris, if you have, you've spoken to some of them as well, but I don't know what, what if there's anything to add. Yeah. I mean, I think you, I think you, you hit on all the points. I mean, the software in some cases for some protocols is more like alpha, you know, than, than what you would expect. And so, you know, we've just got, a group of uh, people, we call them our node ops team that are, you know, I don't know, I don't think they really sleep, you know, they're, they're, they're so dedicated and, and they've built this node queue, uh, you know, software that is really what gets us to that just massive number of nodes and, and, um, and obviously applying the updates and keeping, keeping them running because if you get too far behind, uh, some of these networks will, will, will penalize you, right. And, and things just stop working. Right. And so, um, is it, and then, and to Constantine's point, it's not on, uh, you know, some regular cadence or in some cases, there's not a lot of heads up. Um, some of our engineers are well versed enough in, in the details of these protocols where the, the protocols themselves rely on us to help make sure that, that things are working correctly or, okay, everyone, here's a telegram channel. We're going to restart, you know, this protocol. Let's, let's do it. And, you know, they're, we're the ones that are on the other end of the phone there, so to speak. Right. Yeah. Google doesn't want to be involved when Ethereum is moving from proof of work to proof of stake or, or Solana's down and we need to restart the network. They're, they're, they have their engineers focused on other things, I guess. Yep. Um, do, do you know why they prefer um, node operation is okay, but, but mining isn't? It isn't like 100% maxed out GPU a, a good thing? It, it's a little bit irrelevant now that there aren't a ton of GPU mineable coins left out there, but I, I've always wondered that of why is this workload okay, but this workload isn't? Is it because it's more financialized? I mean, I, I, I can't speak to it technically too much. I think partly it's also available resourcing, right? Don't forget like that that the, the availability of resources is is uh, now at a good level, but partly I would say like, and, and you know, I don't know if that's more tagline, but that we were the largest importer of compute into crypto. And so, you know, it's just like, there's also only that much availability initially, right? Like you need to build out these data centers and functions and, you know, the the amount of compute that they offered for mining and the way they run their pricing probably didn't make it worth it for them. And they couldn't figure out how to do it profitably quick enough. 
So my assumption is, I mean, that's at least what I learned as a businessman is, you know, when you kind of don't want to do something, <laughs> it's probably because your product either doesn't have the right margin on it and or you can't, you know, you physically don't have enough infrastructure for it. Or the third one would be a regulatory risk assessment of like, we just don't want to be held liable under any circumstances for anything here. And so um, yeah. uh, obviously the, the, and that's, I think, one of the other th reasons why obviously these entities need to be so much more careful is because they have so much more at stake. And then exactly to your point, can you imagine they mess something up and a protocol loses billions of dollars in market cap and then people start suing and say, hey, you owe us billions of dollars. And, and um, you know, and so, for example, it creates a much larger risk for them that they might just not care about with the money they make for it. Yeah, their, their risk is your opportunity. Right. <laughs> Um, you know, another thing um, that, that comes up kind of in the crypto community, like thinking of how, you know, large the scale of your operations are as one of the largest node operators is this risk of, of centralization in, in blockchains and, you know, where nodes are being hosted and who's controlling them. Like, what is your view of, of kind of the centralization risks in crypto and, and where things are, are heading? Yeah, it's a great point. I think Decentralization as a concept is, I think, often really very misunderstood, right? Because uh, as an ideological and philosophical endpoint, it's important to conceptualize white papers and think about stuff. In reality, what we're trying to achieve is a, have as little single point of failures as possible, right? That's the point of kind of network architecture. But the first premise of any network also is network functionality. So first, the network needs to work. Right. And so because if the network doesn't work and you're fully decentralized, it doesn't matter. And, and so we're often in between these two stages. Right. And so sometimes networks don't really work yet, but they introduce decentralization too early. And once you decentralize too early, you can't fix a network easily because then you're in this reality of like, now I need to get 10,000 people to press the same button at the same time. And so decentralization lives on a life cycle. Uh, first and foremost, right? Like, and, and so I think um, when you build networks, you start in a little bit like a galaxy, a big bang, right? Kicks off and 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 then the network grows like this. And so um, and so I think there it's much more important to look at a correlation between uh, volume transaction uh, uh, on a network and, and ultimate distribution uh, between node operators. There is an insanely complicated fallacy in this, is that the more transactions you have, the better it is for you from a network perspective to be centralized. And so there's this weird thing in there where, because you have so much at stake, right? And Chris alluded to this. There is this point of like the network is struggling. Me as a network, I want to call someone to help me fix this, right? Um, it's a lot easier to call an entity that controls a certain volume that at least is significant to get you closer to a 51% node count than to call 50,000 different entities. Right. And so it creates this sort of weird duality of like, if you want high performance, it's very difficult to engineer um, with high degrees of decentralization. There's technical ways to handle with it. Concepts like networks like Solana deal with it in a certain way. But but that's just an inherent consequence. Right. And so I think what people need to look at is one, what does a functional network look like? And then how do you avoid single point of failures? Right. Like, I think the the goal isn't necessarily the statement is wrong to say the more nodes you have, the better the network. Um, that wouldn't be the right equation. Uh, the, the equation would be highest network performance and least likely single point of failure, right? That's a better assessment of network quality. And I think so we see ourselves in that bracket, right? So what we think is that we bring, uh, you know, really never 51% of a network to the table, even remotely close. But we bring a significant amount of the network to the table where we can support and hold the network up to some extent. And I think that's important. And what we want to represent here is the institutions, which means institutions just simply means that we do this in a way where we're client independent, data center independent. We, we have a lot of best practices around this stuff. And so that the nodes, the let's say 10 to 15 to 20 percent of infrastructure we operate in a network operates on a very professional standard with low risk of, of simple failure, right? Like, which is like, oh, we just run all our nodes on one software client in one data center. That data center blew up. Now, suddenly 20% of the network is gone, right? Like in a block team perspective, that couldn't happen, right? Because we distribute nodes across lots of different data centers. We have different clients. We think about these things. Uh, we have customer support people around the clock, engineering experts for each protocol around the clock. And so when I look at network performance, 
that's a plus, right? Like that's that's good. Like that's actually like so. If I look at what makes a great decentralized network, I think we add to the quality because of it. And then the hope is that over time, companies like us teach and educate other people. And once in a while, we release some open source software to make general network performance better for everyone over time, right? And so that's really the idea here. And so I think you will always have entities that will run a lot of nodes at one point in time in any network. I think the importance is you, you want to make sure that there's an individual that can control the node. And so it depends on networks, but I'd say the magical number is 30%. Uh, you never want to have more than a third, really, uh, because then you become ultimately a single point of failure in a network. And so there's this question of do we cut back when we hit that number? Um, and those are all debates we have with communities and, and protocols and stuff. But I don't think we're close to that number. Um, uh, but, you know, the reality is that uh, most of the networks that initially maybe thought, hey, maybe there's a risk here with you guys bringing that degree of centralization, I think over time they all appreciated the degree of professionalism we brought, right? And so I always think in percentages, so I'm like, oh, 20% of your network have five nines of uptimes guaranteed, right? And then you have 30% of your network that might have two nines of uptime guaranteed, and then you have 50% of your network that have 90% of an uptime. You know what I mean? Like, And so that blend and calculation is sort of kind of how you need to look at it. And so uh, players like us just bring such a high level on that input number that we can make up for pe- to have room for people to run an imperfect node, right? And so I think on the same end, the more node we run, the more people can run infrastructure that don't need to be experts like us. Yeah, that makes sense. And there's there's so many different kind of metrics you can track that you and, and think of like you're talking a lot about reliability of the network. There's also the access to the network, the censorship resistant of the network. And there's different ways to track, quote unquote, decentralization around all of that, which is why it's a hard to define term. Um, how, how we think of it is that there are there are trade offs across all of those spectrums. And there's also a lot of different approaches depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Like Solana has a unique approach to their goal of having kind of maximum throughput. And Bitcoin kind of has simplicity as a feature where anybody can run a node on a Raspberry Pi and it makes it very accessible and and relatively redundant because it's just so simple and not trying to process a lot. Uh, And then Ethereum, you know, maybe somewhere in the middle getting more complicated rather than less. And, you know, maybe realizing now that they've transitioned to proof of stake, you know, requiring every validator to have exactly 32 ETH, maybe a million plus validators is going to be a little bit complex for the network to handle. Um, so, there, and it, you know, I feel like all the many sub communities within crypto are kind of iterating on different approaches. So it's interesting to watch. Correct. Yeah. Chris, I'm wondering anything from, you know, your more, let's say, traditional IT worldview. Um, how do you observe all of these debates kind of in the crypto world and in conversations around this topic? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, um, you know, we're we're the ones that are talking to the banks and we're the ones that are creating these SLAs and, and uptimes and, and these sorts of things. And so in some in some conversations, I like to kind of think about distributed networking versus decentralization and really trying to you know tease apart what it is that you're uh, worried about in in, uh, in in both of those scenarios. So like double signing and network partitions are, are things that are part of that decentralization d- domain. Right. You know, you don't want to have, you know, the truth uh, in the Amazon cloud look different than the truth in the GCP cloud. Right. That would be that would be bad. We want we want the same ledger everywhere. Uh, and that, and then there, for there to be consensus about what the truth is, you know, and that's one set of problems. And, and we, we in, in terms of a lot of the reliability things are much more classic, like dis- distributed computing kinds of things. You know, you want to have to, to Constantine's point, no single points of failure. Right. And, and you want to have good uptime. Um, and those aren't necessarily part of, of, you know, what we believe in and we believe is very important is of decentralization and, and, you know, being censorship uh, resistant and, and, and these sorts of things. And so to some degree, w- w- part of the narrative change is to say, which one are we talking about? What are we trying to do? We're trying to make things fundamentally more uh, reliable and robust. Well, then let's, you know, take take a take take some you know, uh, learnings from, you know, distributed computing and, 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 you know, for, for, for those of us that have been in, in that environment for multiple decades, there, there are lots of ways that we, that we do that. And what we're talking about is really decentralization. Then, you know, as a company, how can we be stewards of decentralization? And, and in some ways, you know, we, we do that by offering 
70, 80 different data centers, right? And, and, and making sure that we've got a lot of um, uh, diversity in terms of the open source clients that we use to interact with these networks um, uh, and making sure that they're all up to date and patched and, and, and whatnot, um, you know, helps on the reliability side of things. So I think, you know, there's, there's a series of things, but sometimes really getting to the bottom of what is it when someone says we're worried about centralization, are they worried about? Because in some cases, it's really the reliability and, and the distributed computing side of things. And, and we, we have that, you know, I think absolutely nailed. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I, I love the split between distributed computing and networking versus decentralization. I think that's an important distinction to make. And there's different ways to improve on both and differentiate across both. Um, maybe, maybe a fun question to end on. Um, what are you guys each um, most looking forward to? And, and I won't jinx it in, in the next crypto cycle uh, that we're, we're hopefully heading into. From my perspective, I think, you know, operating a company that earns a good chunk of its revenue in also native tokens and thus has a lot of operational fluctuations and metrics has is complicated, you know, and, and, and I think, what I look forward to is more volume and thus over time, more stability so that my life gets a little easier in terms of budgeting and forecasting, which are ultimately things that are kind of impossible to do in the environment we're in. You know, I kind of find it really funny um, uh, in, in crypto is, is um, uh, you know, you uh, and I've, I've heard this and I've repeated it plenty of times. And as a crypto founder and CEO, you live in a four year cycle. One year you look like a genius, two years nobody cares about you, and one year you look like an idiot. And so I kind of like um, uh, to get over the idiot phase and get back into no one cares to the genius phase. Um, and sometimes you just need to sit still and be alive for it, and it'll happen to you in crypto. Um, but I kind of feel like that the negative narrative that surrounded crypto in 2022 specifically um, I kind of want to just get distance between that really ugly time for us also as a community. Um, and I hope that we can be really helpful in defining the best practices also on the governance side so we can flush out these bad players that ultimately are very detrimental to the overall goal that we're seeing. So I think uh, my I'm looking forward to uh, bringing that experience into a larger market cycle and have more better participant um, benefit uh, than than in the past. Yeah, I mean, for for me, I, I, I guess there's a couple of things. I, you know, obviously, there's a huge amount of um, uh, visibility on the tokenization of real world assets, and I think that that's super exciting because it really it really touches a sweet spot. You know, the, the ability to you know move move these assets to fractional ownership. Um, it, it's it solves things in a way that we as a, as a as a world, don't have better ways of solving it. It's actually the best way of, of, of solving the problem. And, you know, and so, and so for me, that's exciting seeing, you know, real world use cases where there isn't, you're not just using crypto for crypto's sake, but it's actually the best way to solve the problem. Um, you know, and, and, um, I'm actually, I mean, I'm, I, maybe this is a bit of a contrarian view, but like, um, I still love NFTs, you know, it, again, you know, having true digital ownership to me is something that is uniquely solved by by blockchain and and the underlying technologies here and so you know whether or not that's popular right now or not um, i'm not really too worried about that but i think in in the next cycle i would suspect that because it solves a real problem um, in a better way than other traditional technologies that we would see another upswing there as well Awesome. I, I love the hot take. And, and you know, it, it really is digital scarcity that is the unifying factor across all different use cases for blockchain, right? Um, so, so super interesting. Um, thank you guys so much. I, I've really enjoyed this kind of x-ray vision into crypto infrastructure. It's been really interesting to learn about. Awesome. Thank you. Yep, thank you. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.